I uh, was hoping Brian would play some uh, like walkout music, like what Michael Jordan came out to, but um, I guess we couldn't get that. <laughs> um, so my name's Ryan Martin. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I work at the Indy Star now and have since about July, but uh, uh, prior to that, I spent a lot of time in community news, which I'll go over uh, quite a bit in this presentation. Um, so I'm a huge fan of community news. Um, I actually wish we did a lot more of it at the Star because uh, we don't quite have the same kind of community news support there that we have, or that we had um, in St. Louis, for example, where I lived, or um, up in Elkhart, where I lived. Um, but I'm really happy to uh, be here, and thank you for having me. Um, by the way, so there's my contact information. I'll also have this at the end of the presentation, including um, a link down here where you can download these slides. I have a few links in here that you may want to check out later, um, but you can click those and look at them um, directly. So a little bit about me. I'm happy to be back at Mizzou, where I was a student, graduated here in 2010. Um, after that, I became an intern for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, a uh, multimedia intern there for a little while, um, and then started working for a company called Patch, um, which I'm assuming, or I'm hoping anyway, some of our friends from the St. Louis area is, are aware of. Um, unfortunately, that great experiment in community news uh, for that model did not work, um, and I since moved on. But after three years there, I went up to the Elkhart Truth um, which I had been telling everybody is the best name for a newspaper until I heard about the unterrified Democrat a few minutes ago. <laughs> so I guess from now on, we'll be the second best. Um, and as Brian mentioned, I'll spend most of the time actually talking about uh, the truth uh, because that's where I actually um, learned to create a plan to execute on a lot of the things that we've been talking about over the two days here at the Potter Conference. So um, we've been talking about this quite a bit already. Um, I just want to reiterate a couple points that I think are particularly uh, uh, valuable. And number one, social is important because of audience growth, plain and simple. Um, that's always how I've looked at it. There's a huge opportunity to connect with your readers in ways that we haven't recently. And we haven't with any sort of consistency as an industry. Um, and you're here for a reason. Uh, I, I think it shows a lot of um, courage and um, smarts to be here uh, because sometimes I found that our brethren in the newspaper industry um, feel like they have all the answers and don't want to go seek uh, more knowledge from other people who've been there or who've tried to do some of the same stuff. So I'm glad you're here to um, join me in this. Um, but another reason that I think social is really important is it's the competition for time. And that's something we haven't talked a whole lot about here just yet. Um, we mentioned the whole standing in line part. You want to reach people when they're you know, waiting to pick up their kids from school or when they're maybe watching TV on the couch, uh, whatever it may be. But I've always told people I've worked with, I don't see the TV stations as my competitor. I don't even see other newspapers as my competitor. I see the HBO Go's of the world as my competitor, or Hulu, or Candy Crush, or just any way that people are wasting their time. Um, I want them to instead spend that time with me, with our, with our journalism, with our stories. And social media, for me, has always been the primary driver, the primary equalizer, to try and get those people to spend their time with me. Um, so as I'm talking about uh, um, how I've created a blueprint to um, execute on these things, uh, I think I'm going to, or I'm going to focus on a couple different things. Number one, a case study, uh, which is my time at the Elkhart Truth. And uh, then hopefully help you all create your own blueprints to get you started. So about that case study, this is uh, the Elkhart Truth in September 2013 when I started. Um, 20,000 Cirque Daily, um, they had launched a digital department of just a couple few people that was completely separate from the newsroom at that time, which was a pretty uh, popular trend, um, or a little bit earlier than 2013. But um, it's completely print first workflow in just about every single way. Uh, I'm sure most of us aren't strangers to that. Um, there wasn't a digital strategy in any way. It was sort of like, let's watch what other people do and try to figure it out as we go. 
And at the time, that largely meant we're going to copy and paste headlines that we have in our stories and post those onto Facebook. And hopefully people will care. That was sort of the um, mentality. But what's really worth noting uh, is there was a real hunger by leadership and by other people in the newsroom specifically to fix that. To, to do more than what they were doing. And in my opinion, it's that mentality, it's that hunger that drives um, the change more than any gadgets or gizmos or any sort of tool you can use. You just have to be able to, to want to um, fix it. So when I started, I had, or I was hired to basically uh, address three um, things. And I was hired as a digital content director uh, number one, create a strategy, which for our purposes is a blueprint. Um, number two, I had a few openings at the time, so I needed to hire people who could execute on that strategy. Um, and I hired a, a couple Mizzou grads, so that was good. Uh, the third, and the third thing was um, we were going through a big redesign for the website, and we were actually moving to a whole new uh, content management system. Um, so we wanted to hold off on doing those things until we had everything else figured out so that way we could optimize the website to you know, support our new strategy. And I think the order of how that went is extremely important and I hope you all take that away from here because um, you don't want to be the Elkhart Truth in pre-September 2013 where you're just kind of copying what other people are doing and hoping it works. You really need to have a strategy, you have to have a blueprint that works for you and your community and your readers. So the blueprint the strategy that we created back then was um, uh, had a few more points than this, but uh, these were the uh, most important, I think, and I'll go over these. Um, but search video, community, social, and mobile. And what's really worth noting here in the interest of um, this talk is everything in some form linked back to social. So search content. Uh, Mike was talking a lot about search engine optimization and delivering on, uh, delivering on that promise for your advertisers. Uh, there's a lot of value for us as journalists in having search content as well. Um, one of the biggest priorities I had uh, on day you know, seven or so was SEO because it was something that we were not very good at. Um, and I'm not going to get into a lot of that here because that's uh, not why we're here to talk. But if anyone has any questions about that in the future, um, definitely feel free to email me, call me, whatever. I'm happy to um, I'm happy to help in however I can. Um, but SEO content is also important for social, and that's worth really remembering. Um, I have some examples up here of some kinds of stories we did back then, um, and you can get the gist of it from reading the headlines, I'm sure. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that are always trending on Facebook. You know, you see the little trending topics on the right if you're on the desktop experience of Facebook, which means that if you post stories that are trending on Facebook about Halloween or talk like a pirate day or whatever, Facebook is going to boost that content higher in people's news feeds, which means your content is more likely to be seen as long as it's matching those trending topics. Um, just like if it's trending on Google, your pages that address this content are more likely to show up at the top of the Google results. Um, similarly, uh, uh, I don't have much experience with this personally yet, but Twitter um, has Twitter moments, which is the same thing where if around Halloween, around the Super Bowl, around whatever, they're going to collect a lot of content that meets that criteria and then um, show it to users. And all the social media are doing this in some way, so that's just why I wanted to highlight it here. Um, and Google Plus is a social media that um, we haven't talked a lot about here, but we found immensely helpful at The Truth as part of our overall search and social strategy. Um, basically, it helps drive search results uh, for your content. So every time we had stories like this, um, not only did we publish them to the Elkhart Truth Google Plus page, many of the people who worked in the newsroom on this content also shared it, which of course helped um, elevate that content to readers. Um, and one of the things that I found most helpful when it came to this part of our blueprint was we actually created a calendar full of all of the real holidays, all of the seasonal things people care about, 
um, all of the goofy holidays like Talk Like a Pirate Day. And we had that kind of like in the magazine world, you have those things planned out months in advance. We had many of these planned out months in advance. And I have Google Docs full of just like every conceivable story idea you could have for 4th of July. So everything people search about barbecues or fireworks or you know safety, whatever it is, um, we tried to capture all of that and uh, plugged it into social. The next part of our blueprint was video. Um, I think the short version of this is you'll have a really hard time growing a social audience at a high rate unless you have a video component to what you're doing. Just as um, social is really optimized about being in the moment around those things that are trending, um, all the social networks are also optimizing around video. They're giving favorable boosts to companies and users who post video. If any of you have logged into Facebook this morning, and I'm sure most of you have, you've probably seen a dozen videos at the top of your feed and then a couple other posts. Um, so keep that in mind as, as we move forward here. And what's interesting about videos, it's even more important today than it was when I was at The Truth a couple years ago, and we saw pretty massive results back then. Um, and you know, at the Star, I'm not in charge of our video operations, but uh, I certainly make sure the reporters are my, on my team, which is the public safety and breaking news team, I make sure they spend a lot of time on, uh, on video just because I want more readers to get to their content. So what we did at The Truth in the interest of uh, supporting our digital strategy, everybody learned video. Um, it didn't matter if you were a page designer, if you were a reporter, if you were an editor, everybody needed to be able to shoot and edit basic video on your cell phones. Um, and it's so easy now, it's so easy. Um, you can pay five bucks for the iMovie app, which dumbs it down for everyone, me included. Uh, and that's a really good way to capture the sort of news video that's happening around town that um, with y'all being as intimately familiar with your communities as you are, you know where to be or you know where to go to capture that sort of news video. But also it's things like the big football game or the big baseball game, uh, talking to the player afterward, or it's gonna be a graduation at a high school that you're covering. All those sorts of big community events, um, it's a perfect opportunity to capture video on your cell phone. Um, but we had, a, we kind of had two different layers here. We had the everyday video that everyone captured um, in some way, but we also had the premium video. Uh, and there's probably a better way to describe it, but that's what I've always described it as. If you all have used social media very much, you've probably learned that what drives you to share content is the same thing that drives your users to share content, and that's content that makes you feel. You feel sad, or you feel angry, or you feel happy. Whatever it is, when you feel that emotion, you wanna share it. So for us, we need to have video that was of a premium, high quality, that would satisfy that emotional need. Um, so we had a photojournalist who, she also shot stills, of course. We still had to put out a paper. Um, but the way she thought first was always, how can we get those high quality videos that people will share? And we did a few other things, um, like experimented with live streams. Um, we, con we created a YouTube channel and connected it to our Google Plus page. Some of those kinds of things, too. Um, but those first two things I mentioned were the most important. Um, this is a two minute reel. I'll probably just play a minute of it for the interest of time. But I think uh, it's worth looking at because you will be able to get a better idea of what uh, I mean when I say premium video. ready to go to bed and then I got a phone call from my mother. Uh, she told me that uh, that she heard gunshots, what sounded like gunshots. They evacuated uh, Martins and at the time that she gave me the call she was outside and she says everything's all right. She's just shaking up. This world I guess is uh, kind of screwed up right now. I mean you can't even go to the grocery store and not be safe. I have sons. Uh, my sons have to go to the Elkhart Community Schools. Uh, my sons have to play at the recreation facilities around here. My, my sons have to go to church around here. My sons have friends in the neighborhood. 
a, a child should be able to be safely outside. And, and I'm not saying that Elkhart is the only place that it's happening. There's uh, kids dying every day in Chicago and things like that. But this is a small town. Okay, so you all should go download these slides later and watch the whole thing because I'm extremely proud of the kind of quality video we did at The Truth. Um, but you can kind of get a sense for what I mean when I say emotion. Um, speaking of emotion, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, another big part of our digital plan, um, just called it community content. Um, it fits very well with what I was talking about with that social calendar earlier. Uh, the same thing that drives people to share your content on their Facebook or on their Twitter or whatever is the same thing that drives them to want to share their content directly with you, the newspaper or the journalist. Um, so here's some examples of some types of content we did where we just basically started a feed on Facebook and asked people to um, submit their pictures, their ideas, their feelings, and then we would capture all of that, and then we would create more content out of that. So a perfect example is the pumpkin carvings uh, thread that we would do, which is basically show us your crazy pumpkin carvings. Um, here's one that we like, now show us the ones you have. There's a thread full of them, we take those, we then create a story out of that, um, which then all those people want to share because their pumpkin carving is included, but it's also something you could put in your uh, reverse publish into the newspaper. Uh, these were extremely popular and incredibly easy. Uh, social, of course, um, why we're all here. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway um, from our social plan was we actually needed to create content that was different from our newspaper content that was optimized for social audiences. That's how we um, got into people's living rooms or onto their phones. That's how we stayed relevant to them. And I, you know, I've given you a few examples of how we did that. Um, you know, it's the goofy holidays, it's the readers react, it's um, some of those low hanging fruit. But there's also um, a couple things we did that were above and beyond that. Uh, one of our most successful things, and I think everyone here um, could pull this off in your communities, is we totally stole this idea from WBEZ um, in Chicago, uh, which is the home of This American Life and some other places like, or some other shows like that. Um, they launched something a couple years ago called Curious City. Um, we made ours Ask the Truth. Uh, and long story short with that is you post on Facebook something like, what is a question you want answered this week? You get a bunch of people who respond and say, I'm wondering what's going in at you know, Main Street and Broadway Street. Or I wanna know how come the school is letting out uh, in June this year instead of May. Or you know, just questions that they're curious about and they haven't gotten the answers to. Um, we then put four of those into a poll have people vote on which one they are most interested in getting an answer to, and then we have a reporter answer it. They, for us, it was a week. We did it every Monday um, or every Saturday. Uh, and they were so popular, because these are stories coming directly from readers, so clearly they care. What we ended up finding, however, is that what started with these sort of everyday questions about why this happens or how come this happens, ended up turning into like a history lesson every single week. You know, there's a sign that's been on the side of the road ever since these people were growing up and they just wanna know where the sign came from. Or um, my favorite, the one this links to if you download the slides later, um, there was a, mo uh, a, a block of concrete uh, on one, near one road um, that looked like there was a bunch of teeth in it and they wanted to figure out why, is that real teeth? Yeah, it's real teeth. It was a weird dentist who did something really weird and the concrete monument's still there. So go check that one out. Um, uh, through this process, we also learned that breaking news was extremely important to our readers um, at The Truth. And breaking news for us, yes, we did have some shootings. We had a, a couple murders, because um, El Elkar is uh, 50,000 people. Um, the whole county, which we covered, is about 200,000. So you did have elements of crime that people cared about. Nothing like in Indianapolis. Um, but they cared about crashes. They cared about businesses opening. I mean, all the things that you guys know. Um, Whereas at the Star, 
it's sort of different. Breaking news isn't where we win on social quite the same way. We already have an audience at the start to come to us for all this information. They care more about depth and context. At the truth, they wanted information quickly, and we were able to do it a lot more quickly than TV stations or anyone else um, through Facebook and Twitter primarily. When it came to mobile, um, that was really emerging back then as uh, um, a really important priority for newsrooms. And I think the number one piece of advice I can give you in this whole presentation is if you don't have a, a decent mobile presence, uh, a website that works on people's cell phones, um, your social strategy won't work. Just think about how when you open up Facebook and you click a link and you arrive at a website, that's just like everybody else. In fact, this, I got this um, stat just a couple days ago. 80% of social media use is happening on people's phones. Um, so what was really important to us is we had to redesign our website so we could have a mobile presence that worked. And it sounds like yesterday uh, there was a good solution for that from the people who presented, so that's good. Um, and it was also interesting, um, I've always linked to this story from Brian Boyer. He's a guy who worked for the Chicago Tribune and now works for NPR. Um, he wrote a blog a few years ago that says, if it doesn't work on mobile, it doesn't work. Stop treating, treating mobile as the other and start treating it as the main because that's where most online audiences go now. Um, and I went over to the Columbia Missourian uh, uh, yesterday to meet up with a um, former editor over there and I saw that quote nice and big on the wall. So that's also what students are being taught now, so that's good. So as a result of all of this, um, here's the kind of social audience growth that we experienced. Uh, I'm most happy with the Facebook audience because that's what, what we prioritized. Uh, but you can see some of the other things that we, uh, um, some other areas where we grew here too. And this was one year. Um, I was there longer than a year, but this was the full year where we created and executed this plan. So you can see how quickly you can see results. And then here's our traffic growth, which I'm even more proud of. Um, just look at how much social traffic grew. And I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, I don't work at The Truth anymore, so I don't want to just plaster their audience numbers all over the internet for anyone to grab, because I don't know if they'd be happy with that. Um, but I, I think we went from something like 1.3 million page views from social to 3 million page views from social in a year. So that's pretty massive growth. And since I didn't have many pictures from this, I just found this one. Um, this is when we launched our new website. So look how happy everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where they put the digital team in this random room with a little square, uh, square form. Uh, although what's, uh, what you don't see in this picture, um, this was February 2013, is uh, how our servers went down for the next month straight because we had no idea what we were doing. So, you know, there's a lot of heartache for the next couple weeks. We got to figure it out eventually. So, um, I learned a lot of things from that time. Uh, I was really figuring out a lot of this stuff as I went along, just like most of you probably do. Um, no one taught me how to redesign a website. No one taught me how to create a social or digital strategy. Uh, I also was pretty brand new to managing people and working with others, so there was a lot that I kind of had to learn on the fly. If I could go back and do it again, I feel like we would do it even better. Um, but here are some of my uh, main reflections from um, the time. And I think uh, to the editors and managers in the room, um, the biggest thing I would advise you to think about is your company culture, your workflow, your org structure, all those sorts of things that are really boring to talk about. Um, look at all the barriers that exist to allowing your most energetic or most talented or most innovative employees in the social space or the digital space. Think about how you can remove some of those barriers to let them be the top performers, to let them figure stuff out um, on their own and then share their results with you. Um, you've probably picked up on this by now, but I'm not like the most energetic or um, excitable guy. Uh, but I hired people who were, and that was important to me. Um, I would ask them all the time, what's getting in your way? What can I do to help? And then I would do my best to help them. And um, that's how I, I attribute most of our success to that, because a lot of the things that I've been showing you weren't really my original ideas. Um, I just played dumb enough so that way I could get the good ideas and then put them all on paper. 
Um, but this is, this is also relevant to people who aren't editors and managers in the room. Think about how you can overcome those barriers if you work in a place where those barriers exist. Think about how you can position yourself to be able to do some of these things that's really hard to do because there's no time, or your boss doesn't understand it or value it, or you have no idea what you're doing, you just want to try something different. It's okay to do that. Um, which goes to my next point, failure is okay. You have to be, you have to be okay with failure, which I think is uh, unique for a lot of us um, because we don't want to get a story wrong, we don't want to misquote someone. Um, we think failure uh, is a bad thing. And yes, failure is a bad thing when it comes to, the, when it comes to stories, when it comes to serving our community. But in the digital space, it changes every time Google updates its algorithm, or every time Facebook launches a new product, or every time something like Snapchat comes along, it takes us all by surprise. So you have to be able to experiment, and when you experiment, you fail occasionally, and that's okay. Um, just have a group hug. Um, and this quote from David Carr is something that I have on my desk now. Um, for all their bluster and outward crustiness, newspaper people can be delicate flowers. Uh, I also remember that through this whole process because coming from Patch, or is very digital, uh, a very digital company, failure was okay, experimenting was okay, uh, telling someone you didn't know what to do but you're gonna try some things out was all okay. Uh, I learned when I tried that immediately uh, starting at the truth that no, um, most of the people were delicate flowers to begin with. I had to, I had to show them how they, can, how they can fail and how that's okay. Um, which also goes to the last point. N we didn't change everything overnight. You just can't. Um, there are too many, th the, the print business is what sustains us. Uh, we can't give that up. So any change needs to be incremental and you have to constantly be patient and constantly be per persistent. Um, because if you let your guard down one day, you just take like 10 steps back. So that's the gist of my case study, and now I'd like to s talk a little bit about how we can apply this to most of, most of y'all. Um, so I want you to start thinking about how you might create a blueprint for either your work or your newsrooms. Um, and I'll have a few ideas up here that are very specific to show you what, um, uh, to actually illustrate some of the things we did. Feel free to steal any or all of them, but also think about what you can do specifically for your communities. And as I mentioned earlier about the order, um, before you do anything, make sure you can answer these questions. Um, I, Joy got into this uh, yesterday um, and if you've ever listened to her talk bef before, she talks about this all the time. Know what audience you want. Um, what I talk to uh, um, people in the, in the truth, it was kind of like know how to win before you try to win. It, if, you throw, uh, if you throw a kid onto a soccer field like, uh, um, uh, oh, which presentation was that, Jeff? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you throw a kid onto a soccer field and he or she doesn't know how to play, they just kind of flock around and chase whatever, where the ball is. It's kind of like that. You don't want to be the little kid on the soccer field. You want to know how to win. So it's pretty simple. If anyone's ever read any sort of business, businessy handbook or um, ever logged on to LinkedIn or something, you see a lot of plans that are very similar to this. Um, you have three tiers, the things you can do now, uh, the things you can do with a little bit of prep, and then the things that you can do long term because you know you need to do it to sustain your business or um, just change the way you're, you're thinking a little bit. So for me, the things we can do now are the things we can literally do as soon as this presentation is over um, if I wanted to. Uh, the second tier was always how can I, I need to have like two meetings with people, I need to walk them through some stuff, um, I need to brainstorm with someone, and then in a couple weeks we can start doing that if we wanted. And then the third tier is, um, it's the harder stuff. It's someone's whole job needs to change, or we need to find some money to throw in a budget to try this out, or it's the things that require a little more time, a little more prep. For me, um, it was about three to six months for the most part whenever we could execute on some of those things. So what I'm hoping y'all can do to make this a little more interactive is try to write an idea right now um, for each tier of just what's going through your mind. 
Uh, and as I've mentioned, you can have bad ideas. We're allowed, maybe this will be our first step into having bad ideas together. Um, and probably the most important tier for most people in this room is gonna be uh, that first tier, because what can you start doing tomorrow? So let me go ahead and give you some ideas for the first tier. Uh, I know that we have some people from The Call and Leader and St. Louis American here, so you've definitely had a lot of severe weather that is snow one day and then like the August that rips through heat the next day. <laughs> um, so I lived in St. Louis for four years, so I, I experienced it too. Um, weather pictures are crazy on Facebook, plain and simple. Um, all we would do is, hey, here's a, here's a picture we saw of some storm damage. What's it look like where you live? And then we ended up getting um, 62 comments on this one. All of them were pictures. Uh, and we have dozens of examples like this. It could be power outages, it could be snow, it could be pictures of lightning, whatever it is. Um, very, very easy to pull this off and people love it. And it's easy because people just take pictures on their phones and then upload it and bam, there it is. Another really easy thing to pull off is the what should open here question. This is uh, what I learned at Patch and started uh, stealing everywhere else I went. Shops on Six was a development that um, had been talked about for years and years and eventually they, um, it's now open finally. Uh, we would just ask questions like what should open here <laughs> when, when Shops on Six finally gets some retailers. Uh, and then what we found is everybody in Elkhart wanted a uh, uh, Five Guys or a Chipotle. And then I think we actually did end up creating a story that was Five Guys or Chipotle, which would you pick and why? <laughs> <laughs> um, this one got 76, uh, the answer is Five Guys, of course. I know we all know that. Um, this one got 76 comments. And if you want to make it even more successful, go find an empty building or an empty barn, whatever, and take a picture of it and say, what should open here? And you'll get answers. Uh, most of them are good, some of them aren't, but you'll get used to that. Uh, another idea, finishing sentences. Uh, in 10 years, I'd like to see blank in Goshen, which is one of the cities we covered in Elkhart County. Um, there were a lot of answers on this thread that I was not a fan of, involving things like deportation or, um, you know, fewer liberals or whatever, uh, and you'll get those. Um, but most of them were really good. They were more places for children and teens, uh, a homeless shelter. I mean, and by the way, here's a zillion story ideas for you and your communities too. Um, this one got 75 comments and also linked back to a story about planning. I mentioned a little bit about nostalgia and historical pictures. Uh, people on Facebook love history. Um, I'm sure you all have learned that already. Each one of these stories got 25 shares each. Um, and these were really easy to put together. Uh, we just rode the throwback Thursday trend. Um, we would dig something up from our archives and boom, there you go, here's a story. Uh, um, I think we would spend maybe an hour on these, if that. and you get a lot of shares. Here's another idea that we totally stole from NPR. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for a really good inspiration, uh, NPR is always the one I use um, because they, they, I guess they allow experimentation a lot more there, it's more of a culture, but um, they would post these questions in this sort of format, it would look prettier than this, but they would post picture, uh, uh, questions and then you would just see tons of answers in their threads. So when we were just starting as a digital team, I was trying to figure out how we could make this, but none of us were good at Illustrator or Photoshop to like make it look really, really pretty, and we couldn't get the creative services department to get involved in the beginning. So um, one of the producers I worked with just opened up a Microsoft Word document, created a little border, called it Community Pulse, and then would type in the question and screenshot it. And now we have an image that we can post to Facebook. So we, we definitely roughed it. Um, we would do these, in the very beginning, we did them once every couple days, uh, just whatever people were talking about. We would just find whatever the talkers were. Um, f just do what makes sense for you, uh, depending on what people are talking about. But this one got 77 comments, um, 
and most of them would range between you know 75 to 150 comments, uh, just where people are you know answering the question. The one that was not so successful was, what do you want the president to talk about in the State of the Union tonight? Um, that also veered off course very quickly. Eckhart <laughs> <laughs> County is a very conservative area. Um, so a few other examples here that you uh, feel free to steal. Does anyone have any good ideas they want to share that they may consider a first tier? You do? Cool. Oh wait, you have to get this, you have to get the mic, the mic, it's a rule. We have a lot of archives where 150, going, coming up on 150 years old, so we could easily take pictures of, do you remember this, maybe share your memories? And then that would be something that we could pull into the print end of it really easily, so we could pull the picture into the print and then bang through all the memories, that, that might be popular. Mm. That, is that is an incredible idea. That is one way to use your extensive archives for a way that helps you now. And you should totally go talk to Joy after this because her passion is using archives. <laughs> Do you have a lot of 150 year old people in your town? I think we might. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very similar to what we started doing at the planet. We had a uh, we have a local historian who did um, does yesterday's news, and we always ran it on the opinion page. But our general manager thought, you know, really that's not the best place to be put it. It's old old news. So um, now we've started. You know, we've got the Throwback Thursday and whatnot. So so what about Way Back Wednesday? We publish on Wednesday, so that's what we do. We put the uh, column for yesterday's news, and then she just goes back to the we got tons and tons of photos pulls a photo from 70s or 60s and puts that with the yesterday's news and so we've been doing that. It's been pretty cool. Yep. Cool. Any others? Cool. I'll, uh, I'll move on. Um, now the second tier. Uh, this is the one that you can do within a couple weeks, few weeks. You have to um, do a little prep before you can dive in. Um, I have fewer specific examples for this one, just in the interest of time. Um, but the three that I find most important are on the screen. So spy on a new social platform for a little while before you dive in. Um, that's important for a couple reasons. Number one, you wanna know the culture of the social platform before you use it. Uh, uh, so that way you don't do something silly that just won't register with the users who are on there. You want to respect how they use that platform, and then that way you can better serve them. But number two, if you or your, if either you or one of your colleagues um, starts to try and serve readers on Pinterest, for example, in some way, and you don't know what you're doing, man, that's really discouraging. And then you just stop doing it. It's like, I created a Pinterest account in 2013 or 2012, whatever. I didn't get it because I didn't try to get it, and then I haven't been back since. Um, and that's a huge lost opportunity for everyone. Um, the other really, really important one is creating that content calendar I mentioned earlier. It is so easy to serve a social audience by having that content calendar, and then you can just reuse that content every year in some way. You have to localize it, you have to update it, but most of the hard work's done for you because you know, if a city has a 4th of July parade, they have it every year. Um, the parade route rarely changes. You have to update who, uh, who's gonna be at the front, who's gonna be at the back, and you have to update, you know, if a new church opened up or something like that, you gotta be able to change all that. But for the most part, it's gonna stay the same. Um, and then post those videos natively to Facebook and watch the engagement just, just go. Uh, I'm not going to ask for ideas on the second tier, sorry. We're running out of time. Um, third tier is the hardest stuff, because people's jobs have to change, their priorities have to change, takes more money, takes investment. Um, the top one is always the scariest one, I've learned, to have someone who is truly digital first in what they think about and in what they prioritize. Um, we had a few people at The Truth who could do that by the end of my time there. Um, some people don't have big newsrooms. You have a couple people or you're a one-person shop, and that's fine too. It's Instead, maybe you pick one day a week where you're truly digital first. That doesn't mean every Wednesday you post everything to Facebook and then you're done. 
I think we all know we have to do more with social media than that. Um, but maybe it's on Wednesdays when you dig into the archives and you create the Way Back Wednesday post. Or maybe it's on Wednesdays when um, you work on your content calendar and try to knock out one or two of those posts that you can, that you can throw on Facebook in, in a week or two. Uh, that's when you have to really change how you think to instead of using Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, as a distribution platform for your print stories, and instead create the kind of content that works on those platforms to bring people to your website, to your brand, et cetera. Uh, live streams are also a really uh, useful thing uh, to get into. Um, Periscope, I don't know if anyone here has used Periscope or uh, um, has followed any Periscopes. Basically, you pull out a cell phone, you hit go, and now the video that you're recording is streaming directly to your users. Um, depending on where you are, if you have uh, LTE or 4G, um, it works fine on there. Uh, you really want to get Wi-Fi if you can. Um, but that's a really easy way. There were, about half of Elkhart County could support this, and the other half just didn't have the kind of uh, bandwidth that we needed. Um, but that's fine. Uh, I'm sure many people here kind of can fall into the same uh, pickle. But there's also some more sophisticated ways to do live streams. I'm just not very good at them, so I don't want to talk about them, because Periscope is really easy. You just pull out a phone. Hey, Ryan. If anyone wants to see an example of Periscope, I was Periscoping you during this presentation, and I just tweeted a link as the podcast came out. I hope it was the good part. The good part. You sound so smart. Thank you. As long as I sound smart, that's what's important. Um, and I actually have a couple more video examples here uh, that are that are a little bit harder to pull off, a little bit trickier to pull off, but we're seeing some good results. Does anyone know what 360 degree videos are on Facebook? Okay, I'm totally geeked by these. Um, I don't, I'm not, you know, as I said earlier, I don't get excited at a lot of stuff, but for some reason, like I'm the geek running around in the newsroom when I see these pop up, where I'm like, this is the coolest thing, we need this every day, everyone stop what you're doing and do one. So this is from a, uh, um, as I'm sure some of you have heard, Governor Pence in Indiana uh, just signed a really controversial abortion bill um, that again put Indiana in the spotlight as uh, um, a really conservative state. So, you know, all the news uh, stations on the coast kind of parachute in and do their stories for a little while, then they leave. Um, but that led to this thing called Periods for Pence, um, where basically women were calling the governor's office and sharing uh, details about themselves. And then eventually led to this rally at the state house um, with thousands of people. And uh, this allows people to actually see what that rally was, looked like. My choice! My body! My choice! So here's the cool part. My choice! I can click and look around. It's like I'm there. Isn't that so cool? Uh, there is an app. Um, so I haven't done this myself. Uh, I can uh, um, put you in touch with people if anyone wants to um, be put in touch with people who have done it. But basically there's an app that you can download where you essentially like stitch together by doing something like this and then now you have a 360 degree video and you have to follow a few rules. It's not quite that simple but it is pretty simple. There's another guy at the Star who uh, um, can actually create this um, and Illustrator and some other uh, pieces of software where um, he's actually wanting to recreate like old basketball stadium or uh, uh, field houses as they're called in Indiana. Um, recreate field houses that have been torn down or are uh, um, just really old and people can't access them anymore as a way for you to go back to the field house and see it all again. So there's like all kinds of ways to do this but the most simple is hey I have a phone I'm gonna stitch this together and here's a video for uh, people. Um, my most recent project is uh, called The Drop. Um, I'll just play it and then we can talk about it. Evening folks, I'm Justin Mack and this is The Drop. Leading off with some really exciting news, Tapper's Arcade Bar is finally getting ready to open in early April. Now star reporter Amy Hainline has the full scoop over at IndyStar.com and I'll be honest, I'm stoked for this place. It's got 47 classic games, stuff like Galaga, Final Fight, Mortal Kombat 2, and my personal favorite, the six player X-Men arcade game from back in the day. Add 12 taps of local craft beer and you've got yourself a little slice of heaven over on Virginia Avenue. Now, to really embrace the retro vibe, I suggest you game while playing some Run DMC on repeat while rocking a members-only jacket. And watch out for that cougar at the bar, Miss Pac-Man. 
Apple showed off its shiny new iPhone SE at an event on Monday, and so far, online reaction has ranged from meh to, isn't that an iPhone 5? But I get it. Despite most phone unveilings focusing on bigger, faster, stronger, Apple's going retro, and that's in. They're looking back to an old but beloved model for this mid-range iPhone, not meant to replace your 6. Oh, this just in. Next year, Apple's going to give us phones that are going to be in a brave new flip design. And after that, we might get phones that we can use in booths. <laughs> Honda announced today that it's going to be investing $52 million into its Greensburg facility to create 100 new jobs as production of the Honda CRV moves from Mexico to Indiana. Let that sink in for a second. Jobs are moving to Indiana from Mexico instead of the other way around. Imagine that, Carrier. And finally, be sure to head over to IndyStar.com to meet Taylor Hunt, a 21-year-old saxophone player from the University of Kentucky. She went viral after a video of her crying following Kentucky's loss to IU in the NCAA tournament went viral. She sat down with her friends over at the Courier Journal to explain her emotional reaction, as well as her fears of becoming this year's face of March sadness. Congrats, Hoosiers. This year, you're making other fans cry instead of your own. That's it for tonight. For The Drop, I'm Justin Mack. So Justin Mack is a na he's a breaking news reporter, um, so he's one of my reporters. Uh, but the guy he's a total natural when it comes to what he just did, as you can see. But it had pretty good production quality. The sound was good. He he had a good presence. We totally roughed it there too. It was like there's a camera and we just found a wall in the building that looked like it was high tech, and we just shoot in front of it. We found like a desk that looks like it's solid, but if you lean on it, it falls over. Um, but it, I think what it illustrates is a willingness and an interest in capturing a new audience using a new method of storytelling, and we're optimizing it specifically for people on Facebook. So that's one of the things that uh, I'm working on right now. Um, I was always told not to end my stories with quotes, but I'm going to end the presentation with one, so sorry about that. Uh, I mentioned earlier about how newspaper people can be delicate flowers. Um, I've also become a delicate flower. If people don't like my ideas, I get all huffy. Um, if I feel like people aren't listening to me, I like just keep repeating myself. Um, kind of in the same vein, uh, uh, sometimes if you fail or you get scared or something, you just stop doing it. Um, so I read this. Uh, blog from Ira Glass, or it was a Q&A from Ira Glass on Lifehacker a couple years ago, and I loved it, so I clipped it out and put it on my desk. It's like, that's my reminder to, to um, be okay with experimenting, be okay with trying something new, and as he puts it, be a um, bleeping soldier about it and be tough. Uh, mine is no longer a bleeping soldier. I had a former Marine who worked for me, so she went and taped uh, be a Marine about it and uh, be tough. But um, I hope that uh, if nothing else you take away from this, you feel comfortable with experimenting, with failing, with trying something new, and know that all these people around you are in the same exact position you are. And um, if you ever need to pick me up, you can always call or email me and I'll tell you you can do it, it's fine. So uh, thank you very much. And we have 11 minutes for questions if anyone has any. Uh, yes, Joy. <laughs> so you've hired a lot of young people with digital skills, and I'm wondering if people in the room get the opportunity to bring someone new on. It's not just about like, hey, do you know how to use Facebook and Twitter, right? Like, what are the qualities you look for and the questions you would ask to suss out whether this is really someone who can help figure out what's right for you? Well, I actually, I want to... Um... I want to break that stereotype for a minute. I think the best person in the Truth Newsroom at social media is a guy named Tim Vandenack, who was our most senior reporter. Um, because to be good at social media, you have to be good at journalism. You have to understand people. You have to know what they're talking about. You have to know what they care about. You have to go to the places where they're gathering uh, in real life and, and, and on social media. Um, he just needed a little help with like tools and giving him a little bit of time to do it beyond just cranking out print stories. Um, and if you guys get a chance, uh, um, check him out on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, he's doing a really cool series right now on a growing uh, Latino population in Elkhart County where um, he's not hoarding all this content and then publishing it at the end. He's 
at an interview, he'll take a video and post it to Facebook, or he'll take a, a picture of a street and throw it on his Instagram to kind of build that audience along the way. Um, similarly, our sports editor, like, he's like, oh wait, I can, I can do this really cool stuff with live blogs, with Twitter, with um, Facebook, and he's totally started rocking it too. And both of those guys were like the senior vets um, who were teaching the rest of us how to do it eventually. I don't remember your question now though, sorry. <laughs> Oh. Uh, I think for me, um, when I would interview people or when I would talk to and interviewed people inside the newsroom to see who uh, was interested, I didn't really care about their journalism experience so much. I didn't care so much about um, um, that they had a fancy degree from a journalism school or something. I, I would ask them questions that would help me understand how much they were willing to try new things. Um, because we can find ideas all over the place and then try them out and then see what works for us. And you have to have people who are courageous enough to, uh, to do that. So that was always important to me. When you were in Elkhart and you grew all your Facebook likes, was that all organic growth based on the content you were putting up or did you do any contests or other tricks to get people to like your page? So the vast majority of the likes were organic. Um, we did do a small amount of um, paid promotion where you can basically uh, make sure that there's a little ad on Facebook where people who don't know about the page can like it and become a, um, a fan. Um, we like paid 50 bucks a month for a couple months here and there um, just as money was available. Um, but you know, we, the examples I showed, they weren't just links to the website. There were um, the, the question post, for example, or the photo galleries or whatever. Um, the whole idea is to make the page really engaging where people want to comment or like or share because then whenever they comment, like, or share, all of their friends who maybe don't know about the page or like the page, they're seeing that interaction occur in their news feeds. So now they're going to come over and you know chime in too. And then hopefully while they're, while they're there, they'll also like the page. So it's really don't think about your Facebook page as a destination where I'm going to type in you know um, Indie Star or the Elkhart Truth or whatever. Instead, it shows up in people's feeds through some actions. And think about what, what makes those posts show up in people's feeds and then do what you can to support that. Then while they're there, they'll click a link or two. Uh, this is going back, and I, I realize this is going to be different for every newsroom, but when you talked about, as a manager, having to remove barriers for your staff that would keep them from trying new things, what were some of your maybe most common or most significant ones? Well, um, a big one when I started was, um, so I eventually became the managing editor of The Truth, uh, but when I started I was you know, off to the side with um, the digital people. Um, when they did breaking news, uh, it was like a reporter would go out, report on everything, come back, then it would get edited, and then they could like share it on social media. Um, I made a blanket rule of breaking news is messy and that's okay tweet what you can confirm, and then someone back at the shop can quickly spin out posts or quickly get that shared to the branded pages, um, and uh, we'll go from there. You know, It's kind of like what Jeff was talking about, where after the game, he's posting stuff really quickly, or he, gets the, uh, um, he hears about a new principal getting hired, he's posting that, and then he'll worry about the print story later. That was a massive change for us at The Truth to think that way. Um, another good example would probably be um, our, we would post all of our stories to the website starting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon through 11 o'clock at night because that was our production schedule for print. So I took away social media duties from the people who were responsible for print and gave them to other people because what we learned was um, the vast majority, majority of our referrals and the vast majority of our audience came in the morning. It was like 6 a.m., you know, and it would peak around 10 or 11 and sort of dip down to around noon, and then it was like a ghost town the rest of the day for our audience, just looking at Google Analytics. Um, so that was a really big change to um, empower other people to be responsible for that.
Anybody else? You're all just so amazed that you can't move. <laughs> it's, it's paralyzing almost all the opportunities. Is Periscope embeddable to your website? Um, there is a setting that you have to click when you start. I can't remember if it's when you create your account or before you actually start recording, where it saves the video for you as like a thing that you can then embed on a site. Um, but it also syncs up to like Twitter and uh, I can't remember if you can sync to, I don't think you can sync to Facebook because Facebook has Facebook Live. Um, but uh, um, yeah, in short, there's a way to save it. All right, everybody say thank you to Ryan.